Good afternoon. Welcome to UCSF Medical Grand Rounds. Today is another COVID day. Thought maybe we would be done with these uh, around now, but clearly that was uh, that was very wrong. Um, we'll be talking about the Omicron variant and the new antivirals. How much will these change the pandemic in 2022? Let's go to the next slide and we'll look at the ground rules, which hopefully you know by now. Uh, you know how to work Zoom. I won't, uh, I won't uh, bother with that. Uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. Uh, Lakshmi Santosh is monitoring that. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Session will be recorded and posted tonight on YouTube. Closed captioning is available and CME credit is available as well. If you're interested in that, stay on after we're done and there'll be a, a address um, for you to go to. Okay, so um, I'll go quickly because a lot of content to cover. F for the last few months, I have been saying that we've reached an uneasy new normal with COVID with enough people vaccinated or with immunity from infection to prevent massive surges, uh, but not enough who are immune, particularly since Delta, to eradicate COVID. And uh, when I was asked, I said, well, there are two possible game changers. One would be if we come out with really effective oral antivirals that could change the game for the positive. And obviously the other would be if a, uh, if a really nasty variant came out that was even worse than Delta, that could change the game in the wrong direction. And uh, of course the rest is history. Uh, on the good side, there are oral antivirals that are being uh, studied and assessed right now. And, uh, um, and uh, lots of new information on that. And that does potentially uh, have tremendous implications for the way we manage uh, COVID going forward. And the news on the uh, new variant, uh, Omicron, which just uh, we just all heard of a month ago, is basically filled with more unknowns than knowns right now. But now one of the knowns is that it is in the United States with the first case diagnosed by our own Charles Chu uh, at UCSF. Uh, and I uh, heard about a second case today, and undoubtedly there will be more. So today's topics are these two um, sort of polar opposites in a way. Some good news, I think, about new oral antivirals and then some potentially bad news, but we really don't know how bad about this new variant. Uh, so I think a very topical and crucial uh, conference today. I'm uh, very pleased to introduce our two speakers. Uh, the first will be uh, Annie Lukemeyer, who is a professor of medicine at UCSF based in the Division of HIV, Infectious Disease and Global Medicine at Zuckerberg San Francisco General. Uh, Annie's been on several times before. She, like many people, she was an HIV uh, 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 person prior to COVID exam examining therapeutic and preventative strategy for HIV. And she has uh, uh, transitioned to doing a tremendous amount of work in COVID, including helping to lead a lot of our clinical trials uh, work here. So, uh, Annie, uh, when you turn on your camera, we can see you. And um, uh, w I think John is here, so I'll also introduce him now. So, Annie will go f uh, give a talk for about uh, 12 to 15 minutes. We'll have about five to 10 minutes of QA. And then, starting at about 12 25, we'll transition to John Moore. And, John, uh, welcome. I don't know, I've, I've interviewed you, I think, on In the Bubble, but I don't think I've had you here before in our grand round. So, uh, thanks for joining us. John is professor of microbiology and immunology at the Weill Cornell Medical College. He's a world expert on virology and immunology. And, like Annie, uh, prior to uh, February or March 2020, uh, most of his focus was on uh, the issues uh, as they related to HIV, uh, particularly vaccines, immunity. Uh, but he has uh, uh, repurposed himself over the last 18 to 20 months to become a really important and trusted source for lots of us, including me and a lot of the media, uh, on issues as they relate to COVID. So we'll get to John at about 12.25 and have about 35 minutes to talk about uh, all things uh, Omicron and, uh, and related issues. So with that, uh, let me hand the floor over to Annie and uh, think of, hear about the new antivirals. I think I have done this correctly. Let me know if I have not. Um, so thank you so much for having me come back, and I'm glad to take the uh, take the positive side of today, although some of the news is not quite as good as we wanted it to be. These are my disclosures. Um, I'm going to take a moment to uh, talk about two different antivirals um, that affect uh, two different parts of the COVID life cycle. Um, one is the Pfizer 332 agent, which affects the um, proteases, where we go from proteolysis to the viral proteins. And then the second is uh, the target of the uh, replication transcription complex, 
um, which is the target of a number of drugs, including uh, remdesivir, um, but today we'll focus on uh, molnupiravir as the, uh, the drug of the hour. So I'm going to start here with uh, molnupiravir, uh, which was named after Molnye, which I'm sure I'm saying wrong, which is Thor's hammer. Here's a picture of Thor's hammer, and uh, I think that was aspirational. That was the hope uh, that this would end up really being a hammer against um, COVID. This is an RNA analog prodrug um, that gets metabolized to N-hydroxycytosine. And then once in um, the cells, it mucks up the ability to uh, uh, replicate RNA by um, indiscriminately matching with both adenosine and guanosine and then leading to um, uh, uh, multiple errors. And thus its mechanism of action is known as a, a mutagenesis. Um, and we know this from other uh, drugs like ribavirin. Uh, this has been uh, exploited before to stop viruses. So what do we know about molnupiravir? I'm going to focus really on the phase three study um, that was called Move Out. This targeted outpatients with mild to moderate COVID with an oxygen saturation of 93% or more. They had to have one or more risk factors for severe COVID, so including things like age over 60, obesity, diabetes, coronary artery disease. And in this study, they could not be vaccinated, um, although interestingly, about 20% of people ended up being antibody positive, suggesting they had previously been infected. Um, they had to have a symptom onset within five days. This is a high bar. We've got to get to people very early. And indeed, about 50% of people were symptom, had symptom onset within three days. If they qualified, they got 800 milligrams twice a day of molnupiravir for five days versus placebo. It was generally well tolerated. We have some data for activity across a variety of variants, uh, gamma, delta, and mu, but not Omicron yet. Um, and an interim analysis I'm going to show you led to early termination um, and an FDA review. So this interim analysis that was released um, in a press release was about 760 patients. And what this showed was a reduction of hospitalization and death in the placebo arm from 14% down to about 7.3% in the molnupiravir arm for a modest but, but impressive relative risk reduction of about 50%. Um, this led to the DSMB stopping the study early, um, and right before the FDA uh, uh, review, the full data set was re released of about 1,400 people that showed a more modest reduction in um, efficacy here, with the placebo arm of 9.7% in the endpoint down to 6.8% with molnupiravir for a relative risk reduction of 30%. Um, so not the direction we hoped things would be going in, um, but nonetheless does look like there is some efficacy here if given quite early. Well, is there a role potentially for using molnupiravir in other settings? And I think right now the answer so far as monotherapy is no. This was looked at in the MOVE-IN study, which was a phase two study of hospitalized patients with symptoms of less than 10 days. Um, and this study was stopped early, uh, unlikely to demonstrate clinical benefit. Whether people were too ill or Symptomatic for too long or a combination of both is not known. With a similar finding in a press release from an Indian generic um, study of molnupiravir, where they included both mild and moderate patients, although I'll point out that the moderate definition was a little uh, looser, um, allowing for sicker patients and uh, with 90 to 93% O2 sat. And this study was also stopped for a lack of efficacy in moderate COVID, although um, they did uh, state that there was efficacy in mild COVID. So <clears throat> what about um, molnupiravir's mechanism of action? I want to spend a moment talking about this mutagenesis, which has gotten a lot, of, uh, a lot of focus, and whether or not there might be impact on DNA. So I've broken this down by the cellular analyses um, that have been done, which do on a cellular basis suggest that molnupiravir can lead to mutagenesis. I think reassuringly, when we look actually in animal models, um, those have not consistently been associated with um, worrisome uh, chromosomal abnormalities, um, um, including with uh, up to 28 days of medication, with the exception of pregnant rats, um, where we did see developmental toxicity at high doses. So this is a medicine that we're going to want to stay away from in women, of, um, women who are uh, known to be pregnant or who are seeking pregnancy. So what does the future hold for molnupiravir? Well, it was approved by the UK um, quite early out of the gates um, for those over 18 and older. It doesn't require hepatic or renal adjustment, no drug-drug interaction. And the way they handled the issue with pregnant and breastfeeding women is that just stated that contraception should be used for at least four days after the last dose. 
As we know, this was reviewed by the FDA advisory panel several days ago. There was a lot of contention around the lower than expected efficacy and discussion about the mutagenesis, um, but it was recommended to move forward by a 13 to 10 vote. So we're staying tuned to find out uh, uh, when and if we will have molnupiravir available here in the U.S. I want to shift gears then to talk about the other mechanism of action, the protease inhibitors, um, and a, a drug that we uh, uh, are focusing a lot of our attention on. This is the Pfizer drug, which is often abbreviated to 332 or Paxlovid. This is an oral protease inhibitor that needs to be boosted with ritonavir, taking effect to the HIV days where ritonavir is used as a, uh, as a booster to get drug levels up. The data I'm going to focus on here are from the EPIC HR Phase 2-3 study, very, very similar to the molnupiravir study I reviewed. Higher risk outpatients had to have an O2-SAT of 92% or greater, had to be unvaccinated, um, had to have less than five days of symptoms, five days of symptoms or less, and indeed more than half had less than three days, so pretty impressive that they were able to enroll people that quickly. They also received five days of therapy dosed twice a day with a ritonavir booster, in general, the drug was safe, and, and similar to molnupiravir, the interim analysis led to early termination. They did this analysis slightly different, differently, with the initial analysis focusing on those within three days of symptoms, so about 770 people. And they saw a reduction in the same endpoint, hospitalization or death, going from 7% down to a little, a little below 1% if given uh, the active therapy. And this was a relative risk reduction of almost 90%. If you broaden this out to the whole group of individuals who received five days, uh, who had five days or less of symptoms, um, so it includes those with three days of symptoms, um, you see a preserved uh, trend towards this efficacy. So 6.7% in the placebo arm, down to 1.1% in the hospitalized arm for a risk reduction of 85%. So this is what we really like to see. We don't have the full analysis set yet, and could this take a hit similar to molnupiravir? Um, that is possible, um, but this certainly looks um, like a very promising trend. On the basis of this, the study was stopped early and an application was submitted to the FDA several weeks ago, and we'll look forward to um, hearing more with the formal FDA review. 332 is also being evaluated in lower risk patients, in vaccinated patients with risk factors, as well as for use in post-exposure prophylaxis, all areas for which we could use more data. So how do we try to compare these? You know, Bob asked me to say, well, how is this going to change the, the world of, of COVID treatment um, in, in the months and year to come? Well, first of all, if we start with efficacy, I think that molnupiravir, at least at this point in time, um, this 30% efficacy has been disappointing. It's in the same ballpark as fluvoxamine, which is uh, probably doesn't act as an antiviral, but more as an anti-inflammatory. And we would need to treat a lot of folks with molnupiravir in order to um, make a dent, a number needed to treat of about 34. Paxlovid, at least with the data that we have right now, um, looks more robust and looks like it's going to be more on par with the um, uh, better road-tested uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, um, both of which have a 70 to 85 percent range um, uh, risk reduction in higher-risk populations. Well, what about Omicron? That's uh, the question of the day, and I'm going to leave this to Dr. Moore to address more um, uh, extensively. But we don't expect there to be a lot of impact from Omicron on molnupiravir or the protease inhibitors. This is speculation, but based on the currently known um, uh, resistance mutations. This may be a different story with the monoclonal antibodies. As we all know, there's a large number of spike mutations, and the monoclonal antibodies target um, the spike region um, of, of COVID. So these are some data that were shared on Twitter um, uh, from the Bloom Lab at UW, basically showing how some of the Omicron uh, mutations um, may be expected to impact, um, in particular, the Regen-CoV and the Lilly combination uh, monoclonal antibodies, and perhaps less so uh, the AstraZeneca, uh, which still is not yet FDA approved, and the VIR uh, monoclonal antibody, which is approved. Now, these are not tested um, uh, uh, in vitro, um, and they certainly are not tested uh, clinically. So all of this is still in the realm of speculation, but it is not outside of the, uh, what is plausible to think that at least some of our monoclonals may be impacted by um, a heavily mutated uh, spike protein like we're seeing with Omicron. So I think we're going to need to stay tuned here. Well, how will we think about prioritizing who to treat if we have all three classes of these medicines? molnupiravir, paxlovid, and the monoclonal antibodies. 
Well, I think given the um, uh, uh, oral route, I think it's easy to imagine that we're going to want to prioritize giving oral medications to the majority of patients uh, meeting the higher risk criteria as long as they are within five days of symptoms. Now, enthusiasm here may be in a, have been a little bit dulled um, given molnupiravir going down to only a 30% efficacy, but I think certainly if Paxlovid holds up, there will be a lot of enthusiasm um, for treating people uh, preferentially with an oral therapy. But I would posit in this moment in time, given what we know about the monoclonal antibodies, that as a clinician, I'm probably still going to prefer these for the highest risk patients those with advanced age, immunosuppression, especially if only molnupiravir is available. Because we know how well mo uh, monoclonals work, and we know that we get a very high, uh, high bioavailability, particularly if given by IV um, when these are administered. The other group for whom monoclonals are going to be the only option are those who are outside of those initial five days. Um, so uh, there is EUA, uh, uh, the EUAs do support using um, monoclonals within six to 10 days, but I will point out that it's probably still best to give these medicines as soon as possible. Lastly, I'll just say that for unvaccinated populations, um, we know that these are the highest risk for disease progression, and we have the most data to support use of MABs and oral antivirals here, um, but there still will be a real need to understand um, uh, how to use these drugs in vaccinated populations um, and as we know, the EUA for monoclonal antibodies does allow for use in vaccinated populations. Well, who should we not use these medications in? Well, for molnupiravir, I think this is a, a pretty straightforward. We're going to want to stay away from pregnant women and breastfeeding women for now. And we'll have real caution in women trying to conceive who aren't on um, birth control. For Paxlovid, it's a different set of issues. We know that ritonavir and protease inhibitors can cause a lot of drug-drug interactions. So this may be a challenge for people who can't hold a medication during the five days of dosing or for whom there might be a worrisome drug-drug interaction. I'll also just point out that some COVID can cause some pretty nasty GI side effects, and ritonavir can make that worse. So for that group of patients, Paxlovid may not be the best choice. And lastly, when we talk about the monoclonal antibodies, I think we're all familiar with the challenges of um, administering these. I know there's been a real push to have vans around the country that can go to people's homes but these are not currently available in all settings. And when I last checked, not available in my own zip code. And we'll certainly need to think about for the monoclonal antibodies, if it does stand that some or all of them are impacted by um, uh, Omicron or other variants, um, we may need to think through um, what the appropriate way to use them is if their uh, uh, efficacy declines. So I want to just end with some unanswered questions here, and, and maybe uh, Dr. Moore can address uh, some of these for us or do some crystal ball gazing. I think we all are really focused on what the potential is for emergent resistant with these oral therapies um, or inherent resistant that already may uh, be in place with some of these new variants of concern. And the group that we worry the most about this in are those who are immunocompromised, as we know that they have um, a larger likelihood of shedding for a longer period of time and have seen well described that um, variants can evolve um, in the immunocompromised population. So that raises the question, should we give it, be giving some of these medications together um, or for a longer period of time in order to reduce the likelihood of viral evolution, particularly in immunocompromised patients? And we just don't have that information. We need data for vaccinated populations to really understand how and when to use these medicines in these populations. Um, I think the vast majority of data now still is in unvaccinated populations. Distribution is going to be a headache, at least initially in the beginning when supplies are limited. We expect this to be rolled out through HHS in the same way that uh, monoclonals and remdesivir were, except there will be a role for commercial pharmacies here, and that will be determined locally. We know that supply will be limited, and if we're heading into 100,000 cases per day, we're going to need to sort out as a healthcare system how to really get our acts together to get medications to people. And I think the key part here will be improving prompt testing for people who have symptoms, which we've really struggled with in the U.S., and then making sure that we closely link a positive test um, with um, immediate treatment um, when feasible. So I'll go ahead and um, stop there, um, and I want to uh, thank uh, some acknowledgments here and uh, thank uh, the Grand Rounds organizers for having me. Great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Annie. And uh, let's take about five or six minutes for questions. Actually, my questions were most of your unanswered questions. <laughs> so I, I will hold off nice on try. them unless I can think of a, a new angle. Uh, yeah. Interesting that you said you today would still prefer the monoclonals over the uh, 
Paxlovid, if 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 it were out, it looks like the efficacies are the same. If anything, the Pfizer drug is better, and it's obviously easier and it's cheaper. So, just more experience or more experience in subgroups that are at highest highest risk. Why why do you have that preference? I, I wouldn't say for all comers, but I would say if I had a really medically vulnerable patient, um, you know, someone who was a, um, quite elderly, really quite immunosuppressed, um, I think that the bioavailability of giving IV monoclonals, you're getting an antiviral into the system right away. And if someone's willing to come in and be treated, I think that probably would be where, where I would go. I think the unanswered question there is if you really are worried about a medically vulnerable person, would you go for broke and give them a monoclonal and give them a protease inhibitor? We don't have any data for that, and we'd have to be thoughtful about it. But um, certainly if they were quite immunocompromised, I think that's the space where we're going to want to really understand what the role of combination therapy is going to be. So I don't mean to say for all comers, I, I, I would stay away from oral antivirals, but I think for, for very vulnerable folks, I would. Okay. Uh, any any evidence or theoretical evidence about transmission? Uh, that, you know what we've shown is da data about severity, but if it shortens the uh, someone's uh, infectivity, that might be a big deal as well. So, do we know anything about that? Yeah. No. It does look like um, for all of these drugs that it does um, shorten uh, uh, symptom duration and it does reduce the viral burden. And so one can extrapolate that from reducing the viral burden that you're less likely to be infectious to others. So I, I don't want to be reductionist um, and say the only reason to treat people is to keep them out of the hospital. There's lots of reasons to treat people. You want them to feel better. You want them not to infect people in their lives um, as well as stay out of the hospital. And I think we have evidence that all three of these um, agents can, can do that. If the drugs, the orals particularly, turn out to be very effective and safe, can you see a world where uh, people are taking them either prophylactically or prophylactically after an exposure, but do not have COVID yet? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's being studied right now um, in some of these studies. And in many ways, it would be a lot easier than getting an IV infusion. We know that for the monoclonals, that's also been studied, um, you know, giving people a once a month uh, injection. Um, if, if they're at high risk. And you can imagine if you have a liver transplant um, or uh, have another you know, bone marrow transplant or are very immunocompromised that it, as long as the drug interactions are compatible, you might really want to be on something like this during a surge. Um, we have a question about uh, could PO antivirals catalyze resistance if widespread use? So how did this balance between the antivirals and resistance and variants and all that kind of stuff, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, you know, it was interesting listening to the FDA panel when they debated this. This really had come up because of Omicron and, you know, molnupiravir causes mutations all over the place very indiscriminately. And so the question is, well, gosh, would one of those be the, the, the new variant of concern and is that going to be a, a challenge here? I, I think that for most people that's really not going to be the case because the viral load really comes down um, fairly quickly in disease once you're treating. But I think where the jury is out is in, in very immunocompromised people that might have, you know, replication competent virus for a long, a longer time. And that's where I think the concern really, you know, would this be the perfect storm giving the molnupiravir and, and just getting just enough uh, mutation, uh, but not enough to, to, to get rid of the virus. And then, and then you're driving more variants. And, and, and it's a bit of a theoretical concern, but I, but I think the FDA was, was biting into that and, and, and was concerned. And, certainly is out there. Okay, yeah, it's it'd be tricky to study too. Uh, you have studied HIV meds for a long time. What are the lessons from those in terms of the system, sort of, you know, and, and, and people's willingness to take them, people's ability to get on meds quickly, adhere to meds, or anything that we should understand about that as we now think about a different viral illness? Yeah, I mean, one is that it's hard not to want to combine these medicines. Maybe that's just my HIV background, but, uh, you know, if one is good, maybe two are better. Um, we don't know that yet, but two different mechanisms of action might help us to reduce drug resistance. The second thing is, is that we really can do test and treat, but it's not easy and it doesn't happen overnight. So I think San Francisco is a great example of a place where, where we really have made it the norm that when people are diagnosed with HIV, the expectation is that we get them treated as soon as humanly possible. But that's taken really superhuman efforts to do so. So if we're expecting that we're just going to release these drugs and say, well, if you have a positive test, 
figure out how to get the pill, you know, within five days, that's not going to happen without us really being organized and getting our act together as a, as a medical system to say, you test here, you get the medicines here um, to the extent that we can. So that's not going to happen accidentally. And I think we've learned that from the HIV world. Yeah. And when you say your instinct to combine, is that an instinct to combine Pfizer and Merck or an instinct to combine Pfizer and monoclonals or combine all three? I, 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 <laughs> probably all of the all of the above. I think we'd love it's great to have options. And so I think we need to learn how these how these work together. OK. And maybe my last question, you gave us the numbers needed to treat and you gave us the efficacy numbers. But sort of the big picture, if it's true, if Pfizer or uh, Paxlovid is truly 90 percent efficacious in presenting, preventing severe illness and death, is that, you know, the sort of it's like the flu thing? <laughs> it, does that make COVID like the flu if it truly is a, a decrease in hospitalizations and death by 90 percent? I, I, I think it's going to help, but I think it's always been hard to imagine that we're going to treat our way out of this. As, as a society. I think it will help on a per person basis. If you can get diagnosed early enough and can get this medicine, it may really help you feel better about your likelihood of staying out of the hospital, particularly if you have other health issues. So on an individual basis, I think that having highly efficacious drugs will be a game changer. Are we gonna treat our way out of this as a society? I think the answer to that is, is very, very unlikely. But I'm sure I'm glad to have medicines because we do wanna be able to treat people well. Yeah, great. The last question, I said, I promised the last, but I have one more. Um, you talked about sort of, we don't know for sure their value in, let's say, vaccinated and boosted people, not so much that they wouldn't work, but your chances of a bad outcome are so much lower. It, where do you think that plays out? So uh, particularly in a young, healthy person who is fully vaccinated, can you imagine that the drugs, even though they work, don't work enough to be worth it? In, 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 or will the compulsion to treat just be so high that everybody's going to get it anyway? Well, right now, remember, Bob, that they that these studies have been done in people who were, had to have at least one risk factor for disease progression. So that will not be at least what the label in the UK or here is going to be. It's going to be you need to be have COVID and something else, right? Um, but to your point of if you had a 60-year-old person with diabetes who was fully vaccinated and had breakthrough infection, why wouldn't you treat them? I would want to treat them. They're already at higher risk. Yes, we'd like more data, and we know that they are at lower risk of having a really bad outcome. But as these variants change and, you know, maybe they are at, at more of a risk, we really just need to understand it more. But it will be hard not to treat higher risk people, even if they're vaccinated. And I, and, and I think it would be appropriate to go ahead and treat them, recognizing that unvaccinated people are going to be at the highest risk. All right. Well, I think our thousand people who are watching also want to hear about the variant. So we could go on <laughs> for, for a while. But thank you so much, Andy. That was terrific and, and uh, really covered a lot of ground. So let's bring on John. Oh, good afternoon, Bob. Hi, Hi John. How are you? Nice to see you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Any, any, do you have any rea- And we're n- no lecture here, so we're just going to chat. Any reactions to anything you just heard in the last half hour? Oh, I learned a lot. Uh, I don't follow the drug development field in anywhere near the amount of detail uh, as as vaccines and virology. So I, I'm aware of what's going on, and I learned a great deal. I thought it was a terrific presentation. And and anything anything surprising about? I mean, where 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 are you sort of living in terms of uh, uh, your feeling about whether the drugs are likely to work, or maybe that's what you just learned? It, it's not something you study closely. Well, I'd be more comfortable with the Pfizer drug than the than the Merck one, which has attracted its controversy and being associated. It had a split vote by the FDA. There's clearly concerns about it, so yeah. I'm not sure it's had the full decision from the FDA directors or FDA commissioner yet. Has it? And it's still pending. Yeah, that's. I think as of an hour ago, the, the Merck was still pending, and uh, maybe it may break while we're talking. Let's get on to. Uh, Omicron or Omicron. Everybody's trying to struggle with how you pronounce the thing. Um, I'm going to do some something you do in court periodically. I'm going to stipulate a bunch of stuff so we don't have to talk about it. But we have a very sophisticated audience. I think everybody understands now that it, there are three variables, infectiousness, severity, and immune escape that are important. And everybody's seen the pictures, and it looks like this has a bunch of hits in a bunch of places that are scary. So we'll, we'll sort of take that as a given, and everybody kind of gets that. Uh, what have you learned in the past three or four days that you you know didn't know when you first heard of this thing? I mean, the data are coming out fast and furious. Anything that you feel more secure about now than you were, let's say, a couple of days ago? 
Well, I think it's gone from a variant of interest to a variant of concern to a various variant of mass panic in the space of a week. And the one thing we're really short of is actual data. I mean, we don't know if there's going to be a surge of, inf of Omicron infections in the States, but for sure there's been a surge of stories about there being a surge of infections and we're all going to die and the world is a gloomier place. And, and it's been really difficult to figure out reality. I mean, you might as well... You know, get a sleep, get a sheep, slaughter it, and inspect the entrails, which we kind of can't do here because our iron cook is a bit sniffy about things like that nowadays. But you know, look, the reality is, what do we really know? I mean, there was among the myriad of commentaries that I've seen over the past few days, the Angelique Kurtze, the chair of the South African Medical Association, put a perspective in a UK newspaper. Today. And I'm going to read you some quotes. So this is the chair of the South African Medical Association. So she's really on the ground. Nothing has prepared me for the extraordinary global reaction to, met, to my announcement last week about Omicron. I have been stunned by the response, especially from Britain, but you can say it's the same here. Sure. Nothing I have seen about this new variant warrants the reaction in the UK. No one here in South Africa is known to have been hospitalized with Omicron, nor is anyone here believed to have fallen seriously ill with it. I'm afraid it seems to me that Britain is merely hyping up the alarm about this variant. Well, that's an interesting perspective. It may or may not turn out to be right, but it's a viewpoint from someone in authority in South Africa who is in touch with the data sets. So there is a possibility that all Omicron is, is a highly adapted variant that will spread but will not cause serious disease. It may be a move this virus is making towards a non-pathogenic variant that is akin to the common cold viruses, coronaviruses. I don't know if that's going to happen, mm -hmm. but I thought that was an interesting perspective. The, the other aspect of you know, new snippets from South Africa is that they're reporting that the patients they're seeing, even uh, younger ones, are not having any symptoms of loss of smell and taste, hmm. which would be unusual. Because even as you surely you know, even in mild infections in, in, uh, with the more wet, better known variants, loss of smell and taste is pretty common. The claim in the, again, it's newspaper stories, um, presumably accurate, coming out of South Africa, that they are not seeing loss of smell and taste. And that alone would say there's something funky about this variant. Hmm. Now, you know, on the counter side, the, the first actual preprint I've seen, I mean, a, you know, a scientific publication was posted today, and it looks at reinfection rates in South Africa. And I, I got it an hour ago, and I flicked it, and it's full of modeling, and, you know, there's a lot of complexity in it. So I'm going to the bottom lines. Reinfection rates in South Africa with beta and delta were not unusual. They were not, um, and no indication of immune escape. But with Omicron, they're seeing evidence that it is more capable of reinfections of people who've recovered from earlier infections. Not a massive effect, but it's statistically significant, according to these analyses, and that would be consistent with the highly mutated nature of Omicron and its pretty obvious possession of mutations that compromise antibody binding sites. So, again, it may well be that this is a variant that can reinfect people if they've previously recovered or break through vaccines. But again... There's no evidence yet that it would be causing serious disease. That might change. I mean, perhaps in South Africa, Omicron hasn't burst its way into a nursing home full of uh, elderly and vulnerable patients. We don't know this. Yeah. But, you know, vaccine breakthroughs, well, we've seen them with Delta. They're generally mild. they very rare for um, people under 50 to die of Delta vaccine breakthrough. And that may be even less with Omicron. So, you know, we really need more time to digest this emerging information, understand the implications. We're seeing, you know, essentially panicky reactions from the media, certainly from members of the public. 
to some extent from the administration. Understandable, if you don't do something in the face of a threat, you're going to get hammered politically. But, mm -hmm. you know, what's doing the right thing? You hear discussions about making Omicron-specific vaccine boosters, and it's fine to discuss it, and it's fine to plan for it. But well, we had those discussions with Beta and Delta. Um, beta and Delta vaccine variant boosters were designed and produced and in some cases tested. We decided collectively, the, the administration decided and the, working with the companies, that it was not necessary to have variant specific boosters for Delta and, and Beta. Beta fizzled out. Right. So we didn't do that. We may or may not to need to do this with Omicron. But we're not going to know that for multiple weeks or months. And it would take much longer to actually produce variant-specific boosters in appropriate quantity and quality and get FDA sign-off and roll them out. And that's a huge decision. Mm -hmm. To manufacture and distribute millions and millions of doses of a new booster is a major policy decision. And you would hope that very serious data would justify doing that. So do you think that the, the, the right call is to sort of get ready to do it, but then wait to be sure that there really is immune escape from the vaccines? Yeah, it's absolutely appropriate to plan, mm -hmm. you know, make the constructs, to make the mRNA platforms, to do the flexibility that you can do with this new technology. And, you know, that even that takes, takes days to weeks. You, know, you can maybe flick the sequence in in an hour, but you have to do a certain amount of work. But to go to large-scale scale-up, that's a much bigger decision. And by the time they're ready to do it, I expect there'll be more data that would justify the, you know, a decision being taken. Sure. At the moment, the recommendation is carry on boosting with the wild-type booster, which would, you know, has been generally increasingly accepted as a prudent thing to do. Um, and and increasing your baseline antibody response to the wild type vaccine would give you some additional protection against a variant that is capable of escaping. So for people, particularly people in, in age groups and, and health conditions where uh, oh, they're more at risk, they should definitely go and get their third dose. But a bigger problem in America remains the people who've refused to get their first and second doses. Mm -hmm. We have, what, 65, 75 million of them, and we have a highly transmissible and dangerous variant in Delta already circulating. So for sure, we're going to have as a nation a very bad winter surge in January, February, just as we saw last year with Alpha. But it will be concentrated in the one third of the country that's refused to give themselves protection. Well, let me ask you a question about that. So this is a sort of a pre-Omicron question, but but the, this matter of how good immunity from infection is, is still pretty highly debated as far as I can see, certainly debated with great passion on Twitter for what it's worth. Um, and it's really a big deal because for those who are unvaccinated, there's a decent chance by this point they've been infected. So what, what is your take on the vac on the nature, the length, the breadth of the immunity that you get from infection? I'd rather be vaccinated than infected. Um, well, for multiple reasons. Firstly, vaccination doesn't give you a really bad time. Like it might give you a sore arm for a day, but COVID is a lot worse. So I certainly wouldn't want to go to a COVID party and get myself mm -hmm. infected if I could go down to Walgreens and get a vaccine shot. So there's an irrationality involved in that. Secondly, look, all of the all of the vaccine studies, all of phase three papers, all of the booster studies, they all compare vaccine induced antibody responses with convalescent plasma pools. And invariably, and the companies make a big deal out of this, the antibody response to the vaccines at its peak is greater than the convalescent plasma antibody response by a multiple, a significant multiple. And, you know, this was an advertising feature. It's better than, than, uh, than infection-induced immunity. So, yeah, there's no question that the strong vaccines give you the strongest antibody response compared to infection. And the best kind of immunity that anyone, uh, you know, the, the groups who really dig into this, uh, and there are several of them, the best immunity you see is after one or two doses given to a recovered convalescent, and it's got this sort of buzzword, hybrid immunity. 
and it combines the best features of cellular immunity with the best features of antibody immunity and it, it, it triggers immune memory responses. It, it's, it just seems like a really good thing to have. Mm -hmm. So anyone who's recovered and has an antibody response would get a much better antibody response and additional cellular protection if they went and got vaccinated. Yeah. I do not want to be relying on only infection-induced responses, and especially for people who got infected last year. That's a year old. That's waned. That's, and there was a study out of the UK that something like 20% of people who had a positive COVID test and some of them admittedly are false positives, but they may have thought they were infected. 20% of them or so never sera converted. So they may have thought they were infected. And there are papers on this now. Mm -hmm. there, are, you know, there are publications out there on people who became transiently infected and never sera converted. So they, you know, they've got essentially no protection at all. They may just think they have. And then the spectrum of responses is extremely variable. I mean, the strongest we've known since May of 2020 that the strongest responses to COVID are in the sickest people. Mm -hmm. Symptomatic and mild infections are not, not associated with really strong antibody responses. So, you know, there's no, to my mind, there is no rational reason to not take the vaccines that are freely available. And it's an amazingly frustrating um, and not uniquely American, but sadly American experience that people are refusing in, in large numbers to take something that could save the lives of themselves and their friends and yeah, family. No, that's, that, that, seems, that seems clear. I guess the, you know, the question is just in terms of sort of modeling where this is going to go. The question really is, if you look at states, for example, that have very low vaccine rates, they're going to have high infection rates and how protective will that be for them over time? And the answer, it sounds like you believe, is less protective than if they, certainly if, if the infected people had also gotten vaccinated, they'd be in great shape. Well, look, the New York Times and I think Washington Post, both about a month ago, did some really, really great graphical analyses where you plot um, vaccination rate against voting propensity by county. And you see that there's a strong, absolutely strong correlation between getting vaccinated and being in a Democrat voting county. And you can get down to that degree of granularity. Granularity. So then you go and look at death rates from COVID by, fact, by voting propensity per county. And again, there's a very strong correlation. So, you know, Republicans now are dying in excess numbers uh, because they're refusing to be vaccinated. So it's another self-inflicted wound by, by Republican governors. So let's, let's, let's pivot back to Omicron for a second. So this issue of outcompeting Delta, is that Absolutely. simply a matter of, of its infectivity or is there a factor that relates to immune escape? So if, if it turns out to be have an equal R naught or maybe even a little slightly lesser R naught, but if I'm vaccinated and boosted, my vaccine, I'm not 95% protected anymore. Let's say I'm 60% protected. Does, is, there, is it the combination of those things that gives it the advantage or it's really all about its infectivity? Well, there are certainly arguments that you should look at two different populations here, vaccinated and unvaccinated. And they may need to be treated separately because the, ability, the immune escape issue doesn't really apply to unvaccinated people, well, unvaccinated, naive people. Uninfected, right. Yeah, right. Uh, sorry, unvaccinated, uninfected. I mean, truly naive people with no immune response. Right. So that then, then the immune escape aspects of Omicron are not relevant in that population, but they are relevant in a vaccinated and or infected population. So it's a different scenario, and you could get a different outcome, that Omicron uh, would not outcompete Delta in the naive population, but it could outcompete Delta in the vaccinated or seropositive populations. So you could get two different outcomes. But, you know, we saw, I mean, what happened to beta? I mean, beta was considered to be quite a scary uh, variant with a high degree of antibody resistance, you know, six to tenfold in, in, in various lab assays, enough to raise your eyebrows. Mm -hmm and raise concerns this spring that we could see a beta surge that would break through vaccines. Never happened. Beta was squelched out by Delta. Well, that could happen to Omicron. I mean, in South Africa, 
Omicron has arisen when there's not a lot of Delta circulating. It had South Africa for good reasons. Last month had a pretty low infection rate compared to its earlier surges. Omicron so arose with low Delta transmissions. Well, here in the States, we're in a pretty high transmission rate. We're close to 100,000 infections a day again. So the competition then becomes relevant. And so let me, let, me, let, me just, let me stop you there so to be sure I understand and our, our viewers understand. So you say it had a low transmission rate. It had a very high rate. Of the, 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 most of the infections were Delta, but right. you're saying there weren't that many infections. The, and so the, it's not a matter of what percentage of the population has Delta. It's really a matter of how much virus there is circulating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, it, Omicron arose in South Africa in an environment where it didn't have a lot of Delta going around to compete with. Mm -hmm. In the States, we have a lot of Delta infections still, and we're mm -hmm. going to get more in the coming weeks. It's just inevitable. Yeah. So can Delta outcompete Omicron, or will Omicron thrive in the face of Delta? And that's just a complete unknown at the moment. And, and the reason this matters, look, this last winter, it was all about Alpha. Alpha was killing 300,000 America, uh, 3,000 Americans a day at the peak in mid-January, but it disappeared. Delta outcompeted it, mm -hmm. and previously, Alpha had outcompeted the 2020 viruses. So it's the winner is the most transmissible variant, and and that's why the competition effect is important. Omicron may be transmissible, but may not compete against Delta, again, allowing for the fact that there are two different populations of Americans now. And I don't think anyone can predict that answer. So that's really interesting, because when I see that curve of South Africa and you just see Omicron taking over from Delta, I just ask myself, like, why, what, what, what sort of element of math or physics would say that that won't happen here? And you're saying even if it was 100 percent Delta, as long as the, the, the number of cases was quite low, it's an easier track for it to run faster on than in the U.S. when there's more Delta, there's 100% Delta, but it's it's circulating much more. Uh, you know, again, all of these are, these are hypotheticals. These yeah. are scenarios that you can you can think about, and the modelers are modeling, but we need the data. Yeah, you know, it's not a given that Omicron will outcompete Delta, but it might. But your first point, I guess I've never heard it framed as this is potentially good news. So that that I that I, obviously you didn't say this is good news, but you said there is a possibility that it outcompetes Delta because it's a little bit more infectious, but it's more benign. Yeah, that's and that would be a good scenario. And, and so how and, and you said there's some evidence, at least anecdotal from South Africa, in terms of they're not seeing severe cases. Is there, is there a reason to think other than that sort of theoretically why it might be more benign? I mean, one issue's come up that if you screw up the spike protein enough that the antibodies don't work, the spike protein is also screwed up enough that it doesn't latch on very well. Yeah, but if it didn't latch on, I mean, again, this is a sort of paradoxical. If it didn't latch on, the spike protein was dysfunctional, you wouldn't get a spreading virus. But mm -hmm. you, so it's clearly not that dysfunctional. But again, if it's true that you are not suffering uh, loss of smell and taste, that could be an indicator that there's some difference in tropism. That there is some, there's just something we don't know going on. I mean, yeah. a, a massive amount we don't know is, is dwarfs what we do at this point. But, you know, going back to this sort of Delta versus Omicron, I mean, if Omicron spreads rapidly but is mild, that would be good. Mm -hmm. If uh, Omicron spreads rapidly and causes severe disease and breaks through in vaccine protection, that's really bad. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the worst case scenario. But, you know, but if Delta um, just squelches out Omicron in the way it squelched out um, Alpha, then, you know, we should, be, we should be rooting for Delta. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't, because we know that the vaccines can deal with Delta. Very few people who are vaccinated are dying of Delta. So, you know, it would be better if, if Omicron is, is lethal, it would be better for Delta to continue to squelch it out. I mean, that, mm -hmm. so again, it's a perverse way of looking at things, and it yeah. may not turn out like this. Yeah. But you, you know, if you game out possibilities, what are you what are you rooting for versus what are you not? And what you're not rooting for is a highly transmissible, lethal variant that blows through vaccines because that's what we feared all along. 
Yeah, we still have a thousand people a day dying, and as you say, mostly unvaccinated. But as a society, you would probably root for it taking over if it's more like a cold. Absolutely. Yeah. But if it's more like a cold, I mean, would it outcompete Delta? That's the, again the unknown. It's it it just seems to come down to transmissibility, and transmissibility may differ between vaccinated and naive people, or mm-hmm. seropositive versus naive in this setting. When we talk about immune escape, is is the if there's a degradation in the ability of the immune system to fight it, would it be the same for vaccine? Let's say it's thirty percent. Would that be the same for vaccines and for natural immunity and for monoclonals? Are those are those all sort of the same version of the same thing, or might you expect them to be different for those three different kinds of immunity? Well, the most vulnerable of those three categories is the monoclonals because they recognize single epitopes and the epitopes that they recognize are known to be, you know, subject to amino acid changes in Omicron. And it's almost certainly going to blow away the licensed monoclonals. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of the next generation monoclonals that are broader active and still in trials, maybe they will cope better. And sure, those studies are ongoing. I'm sure they're ongoing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But monoclonals are the most vulnerable. The breadth of neutralization of infection sera versus um, vaccine sera, they're pretty similar. And and again, to some extent, it depends where you were you infected in by the original Wuhan strain or by alpha or by delta. So the infecting strain to some extent will dictate the breadth or the, or the nature of your antibody response to it. Whereas all of the antibody responses are essentially to the Wuhan strain, because that's the vaccine strain. So, you know, there are subtle differences. I don't think it's easy to generalize. Um, I'd, I'd like to see the data. But, you know, what are we going to monitor? I mean, what's going to be important to monitor is not, oh, look, we found, a, uh, we found an Omicron case in Minnesota and one in California, both of which appear, by the way, to be in vaccinated people, mm-hmm. but both of which appear to be mild infections. Well, that's N equals two. You're not going to draw conclusions from that, but they're certainly good signs. But what's going to need to be monitored for is, is there a surge of vaccinated people in the, in the ICU? I mean, that is the key indicator of a really serious problem. Mm-hmm. And, and, and at least so far, not yet. Yeah. People are asking about uh, them changing their own behavior. It sounds like your main message to us is it's early and we're probably overreacting as a society uh, based on what we know today. So are you changing your behavior? Let's say you have tickets to go somewhere, travel over the holidays. Is that something you're thinking about or uh, at this point you're you're approaching this as I'm I'm following the news, following the science, but not changing my behavior at all. I see no reason to change my behavior at the moment. But you respond to events. Yeah. And and hopefully accurate guidance from the scientists in the administration who have access, you hope, to more information than we do. When you when you think about the immune system, people always say, "Well, we're we're talking too much about antibodies, and there are these other arms of the immune system, and they're still going to work fine." And yet, it seems like protection is seems to be fairly well correlated to antibody levels. So, how do you how do you kind of piece that together? I find that 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 very confusing as we think about you know what a T cell is doing and does it matter in terms of preventing severe illness in the face of a variant? Well. There are plenty of studies that prove that antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, are the principal correlative protection for all of the approved vaccines. And you certainly want that. You want a strong antibody response. Typically, T cell immunity does not prevent virus infections. It can contribute to ameliorating the severity of disease. I mean, we have a T cell immune response for a reason. You would certainly not want to not have it. But it but it's a, it, it tends to reduce disease, but it doesn't tend to protect against infection. And the extent, you know, the, the relative protective effect of antibodies versus T cells on disease, that's really hard to digest. You know, animal studies, passive transfer studies in animals always show that the antibodies that are passively transferred 
do the hard yards. T cell adoptive transfer experiments are much more difficult to do and they tend to have much more murky uh, outcomes. So yeah, I would, I would want to have a strong antibody response over a strong T cell response, but I would also quite like to have both and probably do. Yeah. I, I hadn't heard this observation about the lack of uh, smell and, and, and taste effects. Is there a reason to believe that that would be correlated, for example, with the virus less likely to do other nasty things like invade your lungs or stimulate your immune system or anything no, else? Just that, That's the hope. And, and again, I'm basing this on a news report. Yeah. Uh, so I hope the news report was right. I think it, I read it on two nights ago. You know, I've got a story somewhere. I just thought it was intriguing because that's unusual. Mm -hmm. and, you know, unusual things may either just be complete junk or a clue as to what's going on. So if tropism has changed in some subtle way, you know, it's not doesn't seem to be changing in a bad way. I mean, again, the, the article I read from the, the, the South African medical chair, and they are not at this stage seeing uh, a wave of seriously ill patients in their hospitals. And, you know, you have to take that as a, a good sign. Now, the downside, you know, the counter argument to that is that apparently most of the infections reported to date are in young people and young people tend not to get significantly sick. And, you know, there was another news related snippet that uh, one of the initial surges of infections with Omicron related to college, college students at the end of their academic year, whooping it up at parties, as we all tended to used to do and having sort of local super spreader events. Well, again, if they're college students, they're probably not going to get seriously ill. Right. So you can't put too much weight on that. It's, again, the dearth of information. What we want to know, we're not yet hearing. It's been too early. Yeah, but you think in South Africa, if it starts in college students, it's going to spread to grandma at some point. And if grandma's vaccinated and it's protecting her, there, there's something there. Yeah, I mean, vaccination rates are much less in South Africa, but they're not zero. Yeah. But again, I just read what that South African medical church says. You know, she says quite categorically, as of yesterday, they are not seeing seriously ill Omicron patients in South African hospitals. And you have to take that as a good indicator, mm -hmm. which, may, which and she says this may change over time. Yeah. Uh, one of our viewers asked the question, will and should the U.S. push harder for global vaccine equity? And does this does this make that case, you know, the I told you so case about that? Absolutely. It's what we've been saying all year, that one of the primary, well, other than basic morality, which is certainly important, one of the prime reasons to vaccinate the world is to prevent the emergence of variants that could compromise vaccine efficacy. And here we're seeing one that might. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, there is an I told you so moment. I mean, we've been saying that this could happen. Now it's happening and the world needs its share of the vaccines. Do you, I, I've spoken to a lot of experts in virology and immunology and very few of them said that the probability of a, of a variant worse than Delta, and as you say, we don't know for sure this is worse than Delta yet, but the probability of a variant worse than Delta, you know, it's not it's not zero, but it's not 20, 30, 40, 50 percent. They sort of put it in the five to 10 percent range. First of all, do you think they were wrong? I don't know. Maybe you were saying something different. And second of all, does this mean we're going to have another one four months from now? Oh, I think anyone trying to really predict the future based on looking at sequences and how they how they um, plot on S proteins, uh, I think it's a dangerous game. I mean, you have to respect the ability of viruses to mutate. And, you know, there's an, there are other, I mean, Delta has mutations outside the S protein, that's, and some of them seem to contribute to its pathogenicity. They're relatively understudied, and that's a huge region of the virus that is capable of improving. And any variant that really blows away innate immunity, and there is, you know, SARS-CoV-2 has innate immunity interfere on combating uh, genes and proteins. So, you know, because essentially without that, viruses don't really have a chance to get a foothold. Anything that blew away innate immunity would be much more transmissible. I mean, a lot of infections are probably aborted very early on. Mm -hmm. uh, just the, the, the nose deals with it through um, interference. So there is always the potential for a variant that can, that can be worse because of mutations in a region that was much less studied. 
Yeah. I wouldn't say that. I think predicting that everything, we, Delta is the worst it could be. I, I think that's, that's imprudent. Let's just see the future as it unfolds and not try and predict it. John, we're pretty much out of time. Any last, I mean, I have to say you've taken my pulse rate and my blood pressure down a fair amount, so thank you. Uh, any, any, any last messages you would like to leave us uh, with today? You know, I, I, I truly do not know how this is going to play out. And I try to digest the limited information that comes in and try and keep a sense of perspective. But it's just this mass whiff of panic. I mean, I've seen, you know, respected media anchors on TV uh, interviewing, you know, the standard talking heads. And it's like the, the media anchors are shaking and you can see them sweating. And you, it just is this, what's up, guy? You know, you, you're probably not going to die tomorrow. Um, just let's try and keep a sense of perspective and react to events instead of fearing that automatically what we're going to see is, you know, fire and brimstone and, and hell break out in America. We already are facing a delta-driven winter surge that is going to kill another 100 to 150,000 Americans. That's pre-Omicron. Yeah. And most of them will be in the unvaccinated population. And we're either doing nothing about that or we've given up trying to do something about it because that is going to happen. Yeah. And most of us think that's a pretty bad winter. So, you know, how much worse could it get? Well, it could get very much worse, but I think my money is on Delta dominating the winter pandemic. Okay. Well, not yeah. It's easy to forget how bad Delta is and, and what kind of uh, soup we're, we currently find ourselves in, and uh, that's the bad news. But I think the good news is you've put this in really good perspective and get us all to calm down and wait for the science to emerge and tell us uh, where things are going. So really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. We'll come back to more COVID uh, at least once a month. If uh, if events merit, we'll do it even more uh, even more often. So thanks very much. Stay safe, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.